Welcome to an episode of the award-winning podcast Art Insiders New York. My name is Anders Holst. The theme of the podcast is New York, with a focus on behind-the-scenes conversations with fascinating people who are making an impact in the world of art, design, and architecture. Craig Dykers is one of the founding partners of the internationally renowned architectural firm Snöhetta. In this fascinating interview, he tells the emotional and inspiring story of the creation of the National September 11 Museum Pavilion in New York. He also tells the story of Snöhetta's collaborative and creative philosophy, describing the architecture firm as a place that nobody is from but anyone can go to. This, along with Craig Dyker's Renaissance personality, architect, business leader, artist, poet, nature lover and linguist, gives a unique and rare insight into Snöhetta's international success. In 2020, Snöhetta was recognized as number two on Fast Company's prestigious annual list of the world's 50 most innovative companies in the architecture category for pioneering carbon negative buildings that generate more energy than they consume. I went down to the National September 11 Museum Pavilion this morning to refresh my memory. And uh, I recall that from one of the interviews that uh, it was uh, quite a drama when this all came to being because it was supposed to be a bigger project. I, I think the, the number was $320 million. And then certain components fell on, on the wayside. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened there? Personally, and, and I think those in our office have never really looked at the project in terms of size or money, although often the press focus on that, and it changed radically because it went from this cost to that cost or this size to that size. Um, but of course, uh, as many people connected to that site would attest, it's it really was was about the meaning of those things, not so much the magnitude of um, numerical magnitudes. Um, it went from um, a cultural complex, uh, uh, a building which was meant to house two cultural institutions, uh, to a single cultural institution, which was, uh, the other two uh, were not a part of. So uh, that's really where the change was. The original program called for an art uh, um, institution, the Drawing Center, as well as a uh, institution dedicated to human rights. It was referred to as the International Freedom Center. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a challenge by different political factions uh, as to the ability to manage the vision of those two institutions within the site of uh, the, mem the memorial itself. So some people were worried that an art, art institution would be uncontrollable, mm -hmm. and others felt that the human rights institution would not be dedicated to, at the time, a very powerful presence of American identity, U.S. identity in the world. So they moved on, and it became the National September 11th Memorial Museum, uh, dedicated to the events of that site, but furthermore to um, um, ideas surrounding the future of the site. So for me, in short, uh, the, the difficulty was to move from a artistic culture mm -hmm. to a historical culture. And part of our reason for committing to this project was that we very much appreciated the strength that New York showed by placing arts at the core of the World Trade Center site. When that shifted, it, it was definitely disappointing on one level, um, as we think arts and, and culture are vital to our understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand, I, I respected the very sensitive nature that many people had on that side. And so we stayed with the project and tried to reveal an identity that will expand consciousness there. So our building is a kind of reflection of presence. You see yourself in the building. It's reflective of light. Mm -hmm. It's looking toward the present in time as opposed to the past events or to a, some type of future that we, we can't explain. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we feel we stayed true to our original intentions. Uh, although the program changed rather uh, significantly. I see. So was there originally a competition where, that you participated and they, they picked you? 
Yes, and actually there were many competitions for that site, and we had declined to participate in any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I was uh, situated in Oslo. I'm an American citizen, mm -hmm. but um, I've been living in Oslo for many years with my Norwegian colleagues. And many people were telling us that we might be an interesting addition to the site, but as a, as a U.S. American, I felt that this was for New Yorkers to resolve, and it just felt strange participating yeah um and so we declined many until this came along and someone uh, here in new york city kept hounding us read the program read the program and i didn't even look at it until the last like really almost just a few hours before we could respond positively i looked at it and i saw that they wanted to put arts and culture down there uh -huh. and i thought wow this is important and you know my father is a veteran of three U uh, wars in the u.s military yeah. and if if he fought for something it would be this to to respect art and culture in our world that's wonderful and build a build a place that connects people so that's why so in essence connected. in that meeting that was described in this interview that i was referring to you got 80 million dollars from the governor of new york <laughs> suggesting that the pavilion should be the entrance of the underground museum yeah. so so what transpired in that conversation did he say well yeah. i don't think it's a good idea and you said i think it's a brilliant idea and and then how how did that? Uh, how did that happen? Because I, when I read that, I thought to myself, and you and you mentioned that yourself in in the interview. That was one of the highlights of your career. You know, walking out of that meeting yes. with eighty million dollars <laughs> and, and 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 a commitment that must have felt great. So what happened there? Well, it, it was rather fascinating. The project uh, changed course radically. There was a lot of political factions who wanted to remove everything. Put some, everybody had an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought, uh, we were told that the project would not be funded at all. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I was referring back to my original thoughts about, and our, our thoughts at, at Snohetla was to create a place that could build optimism could build character for the future, build strength in connections between people. Mm. And we weren't going to give up on that. Mm -hmm. We just weren't. Mm. And so we decided to push uh, into it a little deeper. Um, we arranged at, at, at the last second a informal meeting with Governor Pataki at the time. Uh, it wasn't scheduled. We were told we only had 20 minutes. Uh, so myself and another individual from uh, the uh, client's organization, who wasn't particularly high up at that time, he was quite a low-level yeah. person in, in the group, we agreed to go there. We told him several things. Uh, we told him um, many of the things I mentioned to you already yeah. about building this uh, presence on site, uh, the, building your, your connection to the now, and talking about children and how young people needed to be connected to this place. Mm. And furthermore, uh, really the strength of optimism in our world. And uh, he talked to us for an hour and a half mm. instead of 20 minutes. He didn't actually give us any money. He said, how much do you want? And I was, since we didn't expect anything, yeah. we said, well, gosh, I don't know. You know, I was shaking, <laughs> my teeth were rattling. And he said, well, think about it. And on the way out the door, I mentioned uh, a number. Uh -huh. uh, 40 million and the next day he called and gave 60 and then the remainder 20 i think were kicked in by other agencies which gave the 80 million so he gave us even more than we asked and i think that that was based on some preliminary estimates that had been floating around so it wasn't a random number yeah but uh yeah and then i i felt i i couldn't could not believe it it was just a a miracle really that somehow this message which i consider somewhat liberal yeah. to be uh, to be uh, embraced. I see. Um, I went down there today and, and, and I was focusing on the things that you brought forward in, in that interview and uh, there are a few things there uh, that you said that, that, that I found uh, very interesting is that you bring the sky down to where you are through the facade and in New York as we all know we look up at you know what, what, what kind of weather is it if we can see the sky and, and it's, absolutely, it's absolutely right and I, and I started to take photos of the glass facade and the steel facade uh, and how it plays along with all the other facades. It's, uh, so 
how did you come up with the idea of this? Because I understand the ethos of your company is that you are uh, a collective uh, organization in a sense, that you are a very sort of low hierarchy and so on. But someone has to sit there with a pen and say, you know what, I think it should look like this. So how did you get inspiration from the facade and how it's, uh, how it's uh, curved and, uh, and the glass partitions and all of that? Well, first of all, I can tell we are members of a different generation because we know what a pen is. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure everybody listening will remember what a pen is at this point. But uh, yes, we do make drawings. I would say, though, uh, we actually talk quite a bit before we lift a pen or make a sketch yeah. or... Uh, make something in the computer. There's a great deal of conversation that happens in our studio. And we try very hard to push the pen drawing or the drawing deeper into the future as far as we can so that the act of building intelligence through conversation mm. uh, uh, helps propel the project. Mm -hmm. And that's especially important when people have different backgrounds on many levels. First of all, we have different backgrounds as uh, designers. Some of us are landscape architects mm. in Snohetta. Some of us are architects, some interior architects. We all have different worlds that we studied. Second of all, we come from different cultures and different places in the world. We, While we are not entirely diverse, we are rather diverse. Um, we have people from multiple countries with multiple languages as their mother language mm. uh, talking with one another. So building this this common platform that we can create something three-dimensional, multi-dimensional, four-dimensional from is the first step, building a common language and a common story. Mm. It doesn't answer the graphic or the identifying look of something, but it tells you what's going to drive it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that happened uh, with this particular project that you're referring to uh, quite a bit mm. at the World Trade Center site. We knew we wanted to... Uh, building that created light mm -hmm. actually created light without electricity mm -hmm. not not when i say light most people today think electricity but of course light comes from the sun and it's doesn't have any electric power station associated with it and we can use the light from the sun and the light that bounces off all the things around us other buildings trees plaza spaces all that light is built into the facade of the building and there are many magic tricks that we have used to help the building actually create light without using electricity so the steel uh, the stainless steel that you see has tiny little angel hair scratches mm. very microscopic you can't see them with the naked eye mm. and each of those scratches actually um, distributes light because it adds more surface area to the metal so it acts like a lampshade mm. a lampshade will make more light in a room than the same lamp without the shade on it it's counterintuitive but it's true and also the glass has multiple layers of um, sort of silk screen patterns on it that also create light so if you stand on the north face of the building a side that never receives direct sunlight mm -hmm. it is filled with light mm -hmm. And all of that light is simply capturing the energy of ambient light in the air and reflecting it back out yeah. to the viewer. You're absolutely right, because I took a photo right there on the north side, and I got uh, Calatrava's uh, cre creation into it. Yeah. it was, it's just fantastic <laughs> when you look at it. I mean, it's, it's in incredible. But the thing is, though, that you, they said they wanted an invisible building, though. I, I found that very <laughs> interesting. It, yes, it's, it's not true. invisible, um, but it, it, it's not. It's not. Uh, oh, it's not. Um, how should I say? It, it melts in. But it, it's. So why did they want an invisible building? Well, as you can imagine, it was very sensitive site. Um, trauma. You know, I would say that trauma remains one of the principal characteristics of that site. Hmm. Um, everyone that worked on that project, including myself, had some direct connection with the events of September 11th. I was in an airplane looking out a window mm -hmm. at the time one of the planes struck the other building. I was over Long Island. Uh, and uh, the engineers, uh, the clients, uh, people were down there actually literally there that day uh, or the day after digging people out. Mm. Um, everyone we worked with had probably lost, most everyone had lost a loved one of some variety. The, the, the air was just thick with trauma. 
And, and, and I mean, the first time that I visited the uh, uh, temporary survivor center, which was where people who lost loved ones would come to leave artifacts or write notes to their loved ones as a sort of essential uh, uh, uh a pray, place of praise yep. and honor. I walked into that room, my partner and I, we just dropped to our knees yeah. and started crying. Like, there, you know, yeah. there, it was uncontrollable. And still to this day, I mean, I didn't expect to talk about this right now, but if I go down there, I still get very, very, it's hard. Yeah. Just like many people who lived in New York at that time. So the invisible building was born out of that. I think everybody wanted everything to be invisible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wanted the they wanted um yeah. a memorial even to a certain extent that was invisible. Yeah. It's you know, this is the challenge of creating something so near to the time of such pain. Yeah. Um often and I many times said that you know, you really need to wait at least a decade. Uh, before one starts to memorialize something. Um, they say, as a, it's a joke, but it's somewhat true, if you want to um, create uh, argument uh, between people, just m memorialize something. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately, you will have an argument. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, I mean, we, we, that, we had to deal with that kind of uh, feeling, but, but really what people wanted was something that was, was respectful, but inspiring. Mm. And what they meant by invisible was that they didn't want it to be a pie in your face. Mm -hmm. They didn't want it to be dogmatic. Mm. They didn't want it to be beating a tin drum. Mm. They didn't want it to be something that only told you one story forever until you died. So, you know, this is what they meant, and that's the way we approached it. And by the way, I will mention or say this, that architecture often has to cross this threshold where somebody will say something like, oh, I, I want it to be just like my grandmother's house. And you go, well, really? <laughs> and then you find out. Actually, what they mean is a whole series of embedded ideas and beliefs that are symbolized by their grandmother's house, but they don't really want necessarily lace doilies yeah. and brass candlesticks. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right about the trauma, and it comes back uh, once uh, every year. And I think you know people ask, are, are, how are New Yorkers thinking about 9/11? And and uh, I think every year we come back to that. It's like a, it's like a wound that will uh, really never heal. And I also noted we going to move on to some other issues here uh, but I was also <laughs> I, I also thought it was very interesting when you said that the building is really the result of the process that went into uh, designing it and I understand that one of the issues here was that the engineering uh, it was a challenge the fact that it doesn't have a foundation when many people think about building on a site they imagine a plan or a map and there's like a little square line around it mm. and people say put your building here and this is your property we think about the buildings in plan looking at a plan but the world trade center site is in section in other words the other dimension cutting through the site mm -hmm. because here people at different levels of the earth owned different properties so normally we think your neighbor owns one property and you own your property at the world trade center site the ground was owned by one group immediately below the ground another group just below that a third group and below that a fourth group wow. so everything was on top of each other and each group had their own interests and their own uh, development needs. So every time, and we were on top, uh, which is a, an interesting and difficult place to be because with the building, eventually it's got to go to the earth. Yeah. Gravity is is the mass, you know, the, the master of all things. Uh, so we had to get our columns to eventually meet bedrock, and that meant they had to thread through all those different property owners below us. Mm -hmm. And every time we'd put a column down, somebody would move the columns below us, and suddenly we'd have no foundation. <laughs> so we, <laughs> so we finally gave up. We said this is impossible. We're just killing ourselves. So we found the only two places where nobody owned anything underneath. Uh -huh. And we put the columns of our building there, and then we bridged the entire building between those columns. Uh -huh. So actually, the building is a bridge, which is metaphorically interesting. And it's an interesting discussion about politics, because architecture is politi politics, ownership is politics, mm -hmm. and a bridge is what we had to do to manage those politics. Wow. Fascinating.
What are your feelings about the building today? When you see it? <laughs> I was just there recently. Mm -hmm. um, I still have the same challenges as you mentioned earlier. It's very, very hard to erase mm -hmm. the trauma. It's still there. Um, I think about, first I think about the many times that I have not been able to manage my emotions. Mm -hmm. um, once read the names of, of uh, the deceased, I was one of the people asked to read names. And as oh. I was waiting in line to read my uh, list of names, which was only about 25, a woman asked me to see it. I showed her the name. She had a young young uh, child in her hand. And she went down the list. She said, oh, that was my husband. He was in the fire department, and this is his daughter, and she wasn't born when he died. Mm -hmm. And, you know... I said, well, I will read his name. And, you know, we weren't supposed to read their, their we all were only supposed to read their names. But I said, I will read that he was a, a captain in the in the fire department. So I said, captain, and apparently I wasn't supposed to do that. But all the fire people came to me afterwards and thanked me. But as soon as I read that and stepped off of the, the, the podium, I just collapsed. Wow. You know, it took 10 minutes to get up. So those are the first things I think about. Yeah. Uh, the second thing I think about is how are we doing mm -hmm. with our, our world of architecture? And um, when I go there, I do see people taking selfies mm -hmm. in the in their reflections in the glass. I see people t cocking their yeah. head in funny <laughs> ways on the outside like this to see what it is uh, side to side and on the inside up and down to see uh, things in a new way, yeah. appreciating the light and the shadows and, and the reflections and the smile. Yeah. And this was the very first thing we said when we, when we received this project. We said, if we could just bring one smile to one face yeah. at that site, <laughs> yeah. this would be a miracle. Wow. And, uh, and so that was our purpose, and, and I'm glad to see that that has happened. And by the way, oh. that was no small effort to stay with the project. People hated us yeah. for staying with it. People said we were aligned with the right-wing politicians of the time, of the Bushes, and and the and the invade, and, you know, and somehow the invasion of Iraq and all this, and that that we were even there was some kind of representation of an alliance with conservative thinking. And I, you know, th this was a real challenge, wow. and and so we had to make it through that, and and I believe in what we did, and and so when I'm there, I I believe that our intentions remained intact. Yeah. When I looked through the window, there was a screen in, in, indoors, and then there, there, you could see the constructural elements of the Twin Towers. Um, then when I walked uh, away from the building uh, to the south, the building was sort of tilting. Was that intentional? Because that is a pretty, uh, yeah. that's a pretty stark thing, because you, you can almost mm -hmm. see that the building is sort of falling apart. Was, was that intentional, yeah. or is that uh, over... Yes, it Analyzing. was. And, and, you know, this was another bridge we had to cross. Um, there were some people who demanded that anything new on site be completely uh, erased from whatever was there before, mm -hmm. that, that uh, any, any, any intentional understanding either of the World Trade Center towers themselves mm -hmm. or of their collapse would be negative and can seen, seen as a negative thing. Then there were other people who said it had to look just like the original towers and <laughs> it needed to be completely reminiscent of the original towers. And we were sort of between this rock and a hard place. Wow. We, we tried to um, thread a line. We respected those people mm -hmm. who wanted some of the memory of that place because whether you like it or not, it is a part of the story. Yeah. You can say you want to forget it, yeah. but it's part of the story. Um, and also, whether you like it or not, it will not be always the story. It will one day be a different story. Yeah. So we had to we had to sort of work with those worlds. Tilting did a number of things. It helped us reflect light in unique ways. Yeah. So our first reason for doing it really was about prismatic light, mm -hmm. about creating a prism. The second reason uh, was to create this um, dynamic as though it was raising up. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's growing out mm -hmm. of the ground, actually lifting up mm -hmm. as opposed to falling down. Mm -hmm. Although it does at times appear to be falling down also. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a challenging uh, vision of a building. Mm. You can't just look at it and just be happy. Yeah. At times you can you're you're also sad, and that's okay. Yeah. 
I feel we can talk about this building for hours, but let's <laughs> let's move on to to Snöhetta. Let's talk about your your company yeah. for for a little while. I should say to our listeners here that you were recognized as the second most innovative company in the architecture category for pioneering carbon negative buildings that generate more energy than they consume. And on the website it says Snöhetta is a place that nobody is from, but anyone can go to. We are not named after people, and so Snehetla is the name of a mountain in central Norway. Um, it's a, a beautiful mountain, actually. It rises up from a kind of stark landscape. In a, many people know Mount Fuji, and so if you imagine Mount Fuji in, in, uh, in Japan, it has a similar kind of conical um, bowl-shaped quality. It's rather stunning mm. to see in the landscape, and it has uh, uh, been the, the core of mythology and, and narrative throughout history. Uh, so, um, actually, uh, it has a relationship to Pure Gint, it has a relationship to the Norse gods, and so on. Um, and so, uh, this place is an interesting place because it belongs to everyone who visits it. It's about mm. landscape and about architecture because some mm. believe the Hall of the Mountain King or the palace uh, that's often referred to in Norse mythology of Valhalla uh, was uh, situated in or near that mountain. So uh, there is this interesting uh, relationship between uh, connections of people, time, and and ethos. So we... we um, we did. We we feel proud that we are not named after individuals, um, because in our industry and in our world of design, we are so mm -hmm. often uh, predicated uh, our designs on the star or the author, and this in our minds never signified or identified with society that we live in today. This is essentially uh, modernism of the old world the focus on the uh, on authorship. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we have a new world kind of modernism in which our society grows ever more complex, ever more mm. divisive, ever more challenged about diversity and, and relationships between groups. So mm. by eliminating authorship in some direct way, we've made it more possible for us to situate ourselves within the messiness of society and of culture. We have to talk to each other. We build relationships between each other, and that's the way our mm -hmm. designs develop. Um, if we are to make positive change, we have to accept that the world cannot be run by individual leaders alone. We need to build societies. And if we're going to build a society in the political realm, we should be able to build societies within the creative realm also. I, I'm excluding artists from this discussion. Um, I'm talking mainly about the industry of architecture and landscape, as I, I understand yeah. the two worlds are different. How did you meet your partner, Kettle Tredal Tursen? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me when I when I did the research here that there was like a, a group of people that sort of got together here. And, and, and so, so tell me a little bit about that, because I find that very interesting. We met uh, at, at the time of the uh, design competition for the Alexandria Library in, in, in Egypt, mm -hmm. a revival of the ancient uh, library. And uh, we met through friends, and at that time, there were, the internet was very, very limited. Uh, we did not meet through the internet. There was no, people didn't even talk uh, really through email. This was mainly used by academic institutions for research mm -hmm. at that time. So uh, mobile telephone phones didn't exist um so we we just had we talked to each other and occasionally faxed <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh we talked to each other on the telephone we all agreed uh that we wanted to do this we were different people from different places all of us we were a loose-knit group of friends uh -huh. some knew some people some knew others but we we had this desire to to uh, open up our minds and connect to the world around us at that time actually the one thing that was changing was air travel uh-huh I remember when I grew up, air travel was something very unique and very special. I mean, 
car travel actually was kind of unique when I was growing up. But um, uh, air travel was pretty special. By the time I was a young adult, people were traveling more freely on airplanes and young people were traveling, which was very special. And as a result, young people went to schools in different countries than where they were born. Mm. And so we began to meet each other that way. And that's the thing probably that connected us. Mm. And uh, we all decided, let's do this. And, you know, it was kind of insane. We had no money. Uh, we had no connections. We had no studio really to speak of. <laughs> we barely had a name. So, you know, um, it was just a, a kind of leap of faith. Yeah. And honestly, we, we knew we were going to get a prize. We really did. We looked at our design and we thought we will definitely win second place. <laughs> there is no way that they can avoid this project, but there's no way we'll win first place. Yeah. And so when we got the the call, we were we were quite shocked, and we had to reform ourselves. And you know, the client wanted to visit our studio. There was a small studio in Oslo uh, with some of my Norwegian colleagues, and we all situated ourselves there. But we didn't have enough people in the studio to make it look like a real office, so we invited our friends to come in and sit, pretend to be architects, <laughs> so we'd look a little more serious than the young kids we were. And uh, you know, it was just an exciting time, just an exciting time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I heard, I read somewhere that you celebrated running around in the garden at Culver City when you got the, the phone call. Oh, right? yes. That's right. I was naked. I forgot. I was in the shower and I got out, <laughs> took the call and I went outside and screamed and realized I hadn't put my clothes on yet. So so, so, <laughs> in, so in a sense, yes. you, so there was like uh, this collective feeling. It's not that, that you and Ketel had, a, had a, a specific dynamic relationship. Is that correct to say? Or was there something between the two of you that led to other things down the road? Uh, I think the answer is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a collective and we are a collective and we continue to operate on the idea that the diverse mix of people uh, in an energized, interactive way, a transdisciplinary way of working, drives the project beyond what any one of us or even two of us could do. On the other hand, those people that created the company and those that are creating it now do have differences. I mean, and we we thrive on those differences. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think if we were identical in how we thought, we wouldn't be as uh, I think as as unusual as we are. So um, we're constantly looking at at struggling, grappling, I would say, grappling with the differences, which is, again, uh, uh, a comment on society. Uh, we, I think we always wanted to me- yeah. be in the messiness of the world. We, we weren't interested in just going off and making this perfect jewel box in some remote suburb somewhere uh-huh. that costs bazillions of, of whatever euros. Yeah. Um, we wanted to be a part of, of the mess. Yeah. And sometimes that means your work gets messy. Yeah. <laughs> When a client get involved with Snöhetta, what do they get? To what extent are you different than others? I mean, what is your DNA? Is it possible to put your finger on it? Well, um, I mean, it's always a challenging question because there are so many architects in our world that we know of or that we work with from time to time, mm-hmm. not our studio, that do great things. Uh, so, you know, you, you, at some level you're on a similar platform. But, of course, you like to think of yourselves in a way as, as working with something that is driven by your history and your your birth, so to speak. Mm-hmm. In our world, we have always been landscape architects and architects at a minimum mm-hmm. working together together. And as a result, we've been interested in the world around us, not as a barren table, uh, a barren landscape, which you drop a specialized object onto. We've always seen the two worlds as being completely integrated, as if there were no border between the two, despite the fact that there are two very different needs and and very different interests, landscape and architecture. Hmm. This is rare. Um, there aren't that many people that work this way, I mm-hmm. would say, uh, just a handful. And those that do segregate the disciplines uh, in kind of silos of interest. And we melt them together as much as we possibly can. Mm. And this has built us into two kind of spheres of interest. When we began a long time ago, at 30 years or so ago, with the Alexandria Library, we were, I think, more int- most interested in social and intellectual sustainability. Mm-hmm. In other words, the welfare of, of civilization and society, how we interact with each other, the kinds of things that drove us to the Times Square uh, Plaza renovations, or how the uh, Alexandria Library was built to bring people together and, and share knowledge. So social and intellectual uh, 
sustainability we felt would drive somehow other needs uh, for the world around us in our industry. As time progressed, we began, of course, like many people, to be more acutely uh, aware of, uh, of the of environmental abuse mm -hmm. of, of uh, what people many, many people refer as climate change. I, I like to call it just environmental abuse yeah. uh, and and our interaction with the world around us and how our how our industry the construction industry the architecture industry is a tremendous contributor to that so we began to focus on 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 materia materials and and physics and dynamics of, of building as that has moved along we've also become uh, much uh, more uh, closely aware of habitat and uh, habitat and biodiversity <laughs> as an important value because as we see now with uh, the current biological hazard that we're facing, this biological disaster of COVID-19 hmm. that we're all living with, that is the direct result of infringements of human development on habitat and biodiversity of creatures that live near or around us. Mm -hmm. And if we don't care for that, I don't care how many vaccines are created, mm -hmm. I don't care how many masks you wear, you will continuously be creating more and more biological disasters as we infringe on territory without forethought. So habitat and biodiversity are now also an interest of ours, and that's especially important with respect to landscape design mm -hmm. and its interaction with architecture. No, Heta, today you have offices all over the world, Oslo, New York, San Francisco, Innsbruck, Paris, Hong Kong, Adelaide, and Stockholm, if I'm correctly informed. Uh, no, Stockholm was a was an office for a while. We mainly had a graphic designer there, but we've, we've closed that office uh, now, um, although we have many connections in Stockholm and, and quite well connected there. Hmm. Um, I can't remember everything you said, but it sound, I, sounded I good. play it back. Yeah, it sounded <laughs> like the right things. I don't know if anybody caught anything there. Yeah. Innsbruck, Innsbruck. Uh, Adelaide, uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco. San Francisco, we have a studio. Yeah. Mm, Paris. Oh, well, uh, Hong, Hong Kong. Kong yeah. How do you balance the, the fact that you have your core values and when you grow organically like this, isn't there a danger here? Here that you can have uh, growth that goes too fast and yeah. you lose the essence of who you are. Absolutely, and this is a constant challenge. The other side of that coin is that you never grow at all and you just die as a kind of withered out little thing on the floor that <laughs> everybody was glad you died. So, you know, I mean, there, there's uh, there's uh, two ways to look at it. Um, but I would say this, we, um, we build sustainability in our practice. We build platforms for people to think mm. and so to a certain extent Snohat has a frame of mind it's it's a way of a manner of thinking mm -hmm. it's not a manifesto we don't have a playbook um, maybe we have a guidebook of sorts but what we do is we build direct interactions with people we build an understanding and from there people grow their own interests mm. Um, and if you try to do it the traditional way, which is going back to, as I mentioned earlier, the, the single named author who uh, is uh, building this manifesto and wealth of, of, of knowledge that the army must learn so that they can follow, yeah. that requires a whole different mentality, a whole different source of thinking. And that is, is a very dangerous condition to spread too thin. Yeah. But we are not that. Hmm. We are. We have never been that. We have always been a group of people working in interesting and unusual ways in different locations around the world, and we continue to be that. Hmm. So for us, it's not new. It's 30 years old. In fact, we designed the Alexandria Library in Los Angeles, of all places. Hmm. So um, you know that, that I would say our our DNA is is always has always been about connecting with cultures around the world and building sustainability of thought. How many of that group of people uh, that worked on the Alexandria project are still with you in, in one way or the other? Well, we weren't that many, first of all, to uh -huh. begin with. We were only actually five working full-time and five working part-time. I think there's about four or five uh, of, a, of us left, uh, maybe something six. Let's see, I have to count them. One, two, three, four, five. I, I believe five. 
and 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 that's not all only due to changes in 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 uh, where people work, but you know obviously time has passed. Some people have died, and mm-hmm. other things have occurred over time. So, uh, you know, it's thirty thirty some odd years is a long time. I used to have a full head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> How has your role in the company evolved over the years? <laughs> well, uh, they often say that as soon as you get very, you know, it's it's a, a common joke. As soon as you very, get very good at doing something you no longer have the the space to do it <laughs> so you know when you get very good at designing suddenly you have to ma- do management <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know <laughs> so i think over time there's been this struggle of you know it used to be on the phone all the time yeah. before the internet and everything so it was i'm on the phone all day long when do i get to you know have my pen and this and that <laughs> uh then it was you know on 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 uh emails all day long you know, that was horrifying and then and now it's on zoom all day long and you know this is i don't know maybe even more horrifying but uh everywhere around me are <laughs> models and things that i'm working on yeah. uh, i have sketches everywhere um so I, I I I force myself to find the cracks between the Zoom windows to maintain uh, connections with physical objects. Yeah. Um, I uh, for me the the notion of architecture that is not in some way physical hmm. is an ab- aberration. So I obviously when you're older also you you have some years behind you of experience so i try to pass that experience on to yeah. younger people um and so i do more I, I don't i don't like the word mentoring i i really don't but whatever that's called where you're sharing knowledge uh, with others and hopefully they're sharing knowledge with you as i pick up quite a lot from young people that's mm-hmm. the other great thing about getting old uh is that young people are so much more interesting than they were when you were younger <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go for inspiration? Do you find it at work in the projects that the research you do, or do you go outside to other sources? Well, another yes and yes. I mean, uh, by, I'll give you some personal information, others a little more relevant to the office as a whole. I mean, I, I and our studio are basically explorers. We interrogate things. We're constantly interrogating an issue. Uh, we like to, I think, take reality by surprise. Yeah. So how does one do that? Uh, well, in my world, I sometimes like to just get away. And as an architect, it's nearly impossible to get away. Because almost anywhere you go, there's going to be architecture. Um, there, you know, I can go to Paris. Let's go to Paris. Well, Paris is an amazing city full of architecture, and uh, you know, so well, I, you know, and 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 of course, I've studied most cities all my life, so I know many of them as if I, even if I've never been to them, I can tell you how to move the streets of most cities in the world. And and so uh, uh, to escape for me, I really escape. So I love to go alone into the wilderness. I'm I'm not a I'm not one of those crazy survivalists, not mm-hmm. at all. I, I'm I'm not that insane. But for for 40 years of my life, I have gone alone into into the wilderness. So with Theodore Roosevelt Library, I I went uh, out into the national park system there in the in North Dakota alone for several nights away from humans mm. uh, and no structures other than my tent which mm. is a form of architecture <laughs> um, but I, I slept with hor- wild horses and bison and rattlesnakes and coyotes and wow. things like that um, and for me that's to, to feel nature in that way is powerful in Norway I went to Svalbard and went uh, to the to the nearest near as I could get to the North Pole uh, just with one other friend um, those some some places you can't go alone and that's that's one of them Um, but uh, I go to the desert a lot. I go to the Chihuahua Desert, which is where my father is from, mm. uh, these places. And then the other side of it is um, connecting with people, looking at people doing the kinds of things that we design for, going to the libraries, going to plazas, watching people in streets, um, talking with people in the studio, and finally making things together. So uh, mm. if you look around, you can see there are things everywhere here. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so um, we may, we try to make things together. COVID has been an enormous challenge mm. because we can't get physically close to one another. Mm. Um, and we're trying to build in ways to work virtually, but uh, I believe there's no real way in which a design studio can survive without some degree of personal interaction. and collaboration around physical objects everything is changing rapidly i mean basically we have to redesign a lot of stuff right yes and uh some it's a natural human behavior to react in times of, of emergency 
in a very uh, uh, fast and, and uh, innovative way to manage that emergency. Um, so uh, if there's, a, I don't know, if you, if you cut yourself, the mm -hmm. first thing you're going to do is try and cover the cut. The next thing you're going to do is figure out how am I going to avoid being cut again? Right. Yeah. Um, if we if we only thought about how am I going to avoid being cut again? Meanwhile, the wound would just bleed and we'd die. Right. So <laughs> you have to do it one step at a time. However, if all you ever thought about was putting the Band-Aid on and that was it and yeah. you stop thinking, you'll get cut one more time. Yeah. And, the, and our mind at Snoheta is often, as you say, looking at larger trajectories. So we've been more interested in not more interested in the long term design needs than the short-term ones, even though, of course, those are interesting too. So we haven't been that heavily involved in making temporary restaurant spaces outside in the city, although we have given advice on some of those. Uh, we haven't been interested in making uh, sort of temporary uh, uh, or, let's say, interim, the, the, designing the things you need to do to make sure you don't have a fever when you step into a building or making the lobbies more safe mm -hmm. in the short term, because many people are interested in that. Our interest is in the long term. So what does that mean? Um, we believe that you cannot avoid uh, social needs as a human being. Mm. You must be social, otherwise you're not human. Yeah. And that social uh, uh, desire goes well beyond uh, virtual connections. Mm -hmm. um, we need to actually smell people, we need to touch people, uh, and we need to taste people, mm. <laughs> other people. And all of those things uh, as beyond sight uh, are what give us humanity, yeah. and uh, if we if we if we look at how we can do that better in the future, so that we can avoid biological hazards, yeah. then we will be better off as a society. So the great uh, societies of the world were often founded in tragedies like that one that we're living through now. Hmm. Athens had the great uh, um, pandemics and and uh, deaths from a biological disaster also that led to the Greece uh, that we know of as uh, the ancient world's foundations. Uh, issues of democracy came from plagues. Uh, abilities for people to interact more safely with one another came from disasters. I wish it weren't that way. I mm -hmm. wish we didn't need disasters to hit us in the face before we improved as a world, but that's just the way it is. So one can hope <laughs> that this madness that we're living through will help us understand how to be better with the world around us and with each other. Yeah. Now, you live in Dumbo? I do. I live in Brooklyn. That's correct. And you work in downtown Manhattan? Yes, just uh, outside your window. Yeah, behind you, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll probably see you from here. Um, yeah. <laughs> what is New York to you as an architect? <laughs> how, what is your It's hard for anyone. I think... Yeah, I mean, I think anyone, even if you've never been to New York, say that New York's a part of their life. It's just ingrained in global society. It's one of the great cities like Paris and like yeah. Beijing, other places. Um, you know, it's just a, a miracle of a, of a city. Um, it's also, you know, so modern. It's so near to, to our time yeah. that you can see all the problems of our own world in it. We don't look at New York and see the problems of the world that used to be, as yeah. we see in other cities. We see the problems of our world now which is, is, is uh, scary and delightful at the same time. Um, for me, I came to New York the first time way back in 1971 when I was just a child. I have a wonderful father and mother who were interested in all kinds of very unusual things, uh, jazz music, um, um, you know, contemporary painting that we would now look at as being rather progressive for the time. Mm. When we came to New York, my father took me uh, to the Blue Note, and I remember we saw Bill Evans. I was just like a 10-year-old. <laughs> and, wow. and New York was scary as hell, yeah. especially as a 10-year-old. I looked out the window, and there was just, you know, destruction everywhere. And uh, uh, Central Park looked like the scariest thing I think I could have ever imagined in 1971. And it was, you know, around the time that the Bronx was soon to burn. And, and it was just horrifying time for New York City. And it, it went bankrupt and so on. Um, but it stayed with me forever. The dynamic character, the energy that was in the Blue Note and on the people on the street and everybody was just really nice to me as a little kid yeah. and you know and 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 uh, they, just you could feel creativity yeah. and New York's still like that. People try to kill it you know, how many more chain stores can we have before exactly. it's dead? 
you know, but you can't kill New York. COVID-19 will not kill it. No, nothing will kill it. It's going to be around for a long time. It may be messed up as hell, but it's definitely going to be pulsating away. Yeah. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear, um, Craig. Well, uh, I, I, this is wonderful uh, talking to you. I have to say, very inspirational. I feel much better now after having this conversation with you. One thing I found interesting, though, this connection between art and architecture, you are an artist yourself. You paint, even though you don't show your painting. Yeah, it's true, and we, we work a lot with uh, a number of artists in New York and around the world. Yeah. Um, we are constantly interacting with artists. We, we feel their energy helps change our perspective, and we also know that our way of working helps them develop also. So it's a, it's a bridge. We have firmly denounced any real connection between artists and architects because they are not the same. Uh, they're very different. Yeah. Nevertheless, we're distant siblings or diff distant cousins, so yeah. we share energy uh, with each other, yeah. uh, but we respect that we have different ways of thinking, and I think that's what helps us. I've always felt that an artist treats their work almost like a living creature, like a, a literally alive. If you were to touch it, it would be like touching someone's baby in the street. Yeah. An architect can't exist that way. We have to change. We have to manipulate. We have to move. People could not live inside works of art. They can uh -huh. only live within works of architecture. And so the advantage we have is our dynamic interpretation, our changing understanding. We can have artistic feelings yeah. But we are not creating art. And just likewise, an artist is architectural as they may be or never actually creating works of architecture, even if they're inspired by architecture. So uh, here we've been working with uh, a great many artists uh, here and overseas. In New York, we work with Jose Parla. We work with the uh, Ghetto Gastro team. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with JR and uh, working with uh, Prune. Uh, an interesting artist, too, who's uh, in France. Um, gosh, the list is quite long. Uh, uh, Ansen Stad, who's a Norwegian photographer uh, we've worked with. Gosh, uh, quite many. Actually, over the years, I think we've counted nearly 200 artists we've collaborated wow. directly with. Wow. And now you're working with the San Francisco MoMA, or is that is that completed, or is it uh, underway? Yes, it's finished, uh -huh. and we were very proud of that mm. um, for many reasons, but one reason in particular is that Many people are frightened by artists, actually, um, even though they find them intriguing and so on. They think artists are like these scary people who are going to offend them as soon as you walk yeah. up and say hello. Like, how dare you say hello? What are you saying hello about? You know, you obviously don't know why you're saying hello. Stop with all the niceties. Right? That's, some people are like that. So there were all these stories about how when we finished the building, the artists, are, you know, are not going to want who. They're going to hate this and they're going to hate that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have to, oh, you're going to meet Ansel Kiefer. He's just going to uh, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it turns out, of course, that's not true. Um, I mean, obviously, artists are interesting because they're challenging, but they're also really amazing, and they connect to places like SF MoMA in a direct way. And we were told by many artists, many who I truly respect, yeah. that they enjoyed hanging their works in those galleries yeah. because there was an affinity to the zeitgeist of the art world that those galleries represented. The outside of the building might be called architecture with a big A, mm -hmm. but the heart is not. Mm -hmm. The heart of it is 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 uh, is uh, truly devoted to art, whether mm -hmm. it's a small A or a big A art. Wow, fascinating. Craig, what can I say? Thank you so much for taking the time um, mm -hmm. to be a guest on our show, and um, I really look forward to uh, to edit this, even though I don't think it needs a lot of <laughs> editing. <laughs> you know, so uh, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much for for doing this. And maybe we'll meet six feet apart somewhere. I, I certainly home. hope so. Uh, I, I I do really hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. It's been it's been a pleasure. This is Art Insiders New York, and my name is Anders Holst. If you enjoyed this episode and have family and friends who love New York and are passionate about the world of art, design and architecture in the city, please spread the word by following us on artinsidersnewyork.com or liking us on our Facebook page, Art Insiders New York, where we publish newsworthy material all the time. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. This episode was produced by UOM LLC, copyright 2021.